Oh, that smells good. Getting close. Oh, I didn't realize you were on my back porch. Welcome. This is Pastor Jeff Person. Welcome to another edition of Wednesday Reflections. Oh, these are just times that we pause long enough to reflect on the truth of God's Word. That's the kind of reflections we need to do. So oftentimes we find ourselves in a rut because we look in the rearview mirror too much, but we're focusing when we do that on our failures and our, 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 our misgivings, our, the, the ways that we fall short. But the kind of looking in the rearview mirror today is what I want to look back on and just reflect on the truths that we have learned, the things that we have established as fundamental principles that we shared about last week. Uh, but I want us to reflect on the truth of God's Word and how that can become an anchor for us to hold on to during times that are unsettling. Uh, and these are unsettling times. Uh, listen to the news and it seems like hour by hour things are exponentially getting worse. But I've not come here today to describe how bad the dilemma is, but I've come to just get us to pause long enough to think about the goodness of the Lord and how He has not changed. Um, I've been a Christian for a long time. I was saved at eight years old and I've not been a perfect believer during all that time I can assure you uh, just ask my parents uh, and ask my wife especially but uh, it, it's been a it's been a journey it's been a journey of growth and learning being discipled being schooled learning falling getting up continuing on sometimes the getting up wasn't so easy uh, but thank God there were some people around me that were there to help me up and help me to, to continue walking this, this journey. And so this that I want to share with us today is, is really looking back on how difficult some of our journeys are and some things I've observed through my years of being a Christian, and that is the lack of spiritual confidence. And as it would relate to what I want to talk about today, and that is spiritual contentment or contentment in general. Uh, I want to I look at the Word of the Lord today and we're going to look at the book of Philippians, Paul's letter to the church at Philippi. And in future sessions we're going to get a little deeper in this, but today I want to kind of give you a snapshot at the end, so to speak, and give you a glimpse of where we're headed and then in the coming weeks, we'll unpack this, especially concentrating on chapter 4. We'll unpack that powerful chapter that is laden with so many layers of truth that will benefit us, uh, especially if we learn to apply them. I I'm firmly believe that teaching and studying the Bible has got to be more than just learning information. It's got to be more than, than just remembering when something happened or in what order something happened. We've got to find a way to apply it. If we can't apply it, if I teach and I don't offer you a way to apply that teaching, then I've failed as a teacher. And so this is going to be very application driven, how this affects where we live, what we're dealing with. But I want to talk about contentment today and how that is maybe greatly, grossly different from how modern culture views contentment and maybe how Scripture looks at contentment and what Paul teaches. Uh, so let me just read to you a, a couple of verses from Philippians chapter 4. I'm going to begin reading with verse number 11. He says, Not that I speak from want, for I have learned to be content. Now that's part and parcel what we're going to be dealing with today. For I've learned to be content in whatever circumstances I am. I know how to get along with humble means, and I also know how to live in prosperity. In any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of being filled and going hungry, both of having abundance and suffering need. He then says in verse 13, I can do all things through Christ, through Him who strengthens me. May the Lord add His blessings to His Word today. 
contentment is is a word that is maybe grossly misunderstood or misapplied in our culture today. Uh, contentment here that Paul is talking about is a model, a picture of something desired. But let's first look at this word content. I find it interesting that in our modern lens of culture that we look through, contentment has a almost a negative connotation. Let me let me tell you first a few things contentment is not. It's not compromise or simply settling for something less. It's not a state of resignation where you realize something can't be attained. Say, for instance, you've set a goal for something and you realize you can't obtain that goal so you become content with something less. That's not what contentment, at least in the scriptural sense, is speaking to. Uh, contentment is not, let me emphasize, not a lack of aspiration. It's not an attitude of laziness or it's not a, an attitude of settling or a lack of looking forward. But contentment is something much different. The, in the context here in this in Philippians 4 content or contentment is the is from the Greek word autarkes which means to be sufficient or satiated I love that word satiated uh, it means to be filled it means to be full of something that leaves no room for anything else for instance a sponge can only hold so much water and then if you touch it water oozes out that sponge can only contain so much, but it's full. It can hold nothing else. That's what it means to be satiated. So contentment in the context of Scripture here, it means to be sufficient or satiated, not lacking any good thing, to be uninfluenced by external circumstances. Now, Paul makes this statement here. I've learned to be content. Now, we'll deal with, with learned or the, the aspect of learning in a second, but this phrase just captures my heart today as we, as we sit here in this place of, by the way, this is my happy place, uh, one of my happy places. Uh, sitting here on the back porch, I'm cooking, smoking a Boston butt, and uh, looking forward to that for supper this evening. It's a beautiful day, a little on the chilly side, but... The Apostle Paul is speaking to us here, and he's saying, I've learned to be content. I've learned to find a place where my ability to have joy, happiness, or peace, or rest is not dependent on anything else but one singular thing, and that is my relationship with Christ, my standing with Him. Contentment then becomes this notion of it doesn't require God and anything else. As, as I've contemplated this, I think so often we fall into the trap of thinking the planets have to become in perfect alignment or, or things have to fall in place just right or I can't be happy until, until this happens. And if this doesn't happen, then I'm in a perpetual state of unhappiness or discontent, if you will. That really speaks to to who we are as people, what makes us who we are. And in a future uh, session with this, we'll deal more how we define ourselves and, and how that is so valuable and so important to every other aspect of our walk with, with God. Uh, but we find ourselves in this place of discontentment because things haven't worked out properly or worked out right or haven't happened according to what we expected them to be. And we come to a place of disappointment. And then that leads us to a place of discontentment. But Paul was saying here that I've learned to be content. Now the setting here was Paul was a traveling evangelist, if you will. And, and he had ministered to the church at Philippi. And, and they had intentions of sending support for him. And there was some delay in that. Things, you know, didn't work out just right. He couldn't communicate that support right away. And some time elapsed by. And Paul was communicating with them and says, listen, oh, 
I want you to understand something. I'm thankful for your gift. I'm thankful for what you're doing. But I've learned to be content. In other words, Paul was saying, I wasn't sitting around wringing my hands waiting for what you were going to do for me so I could be content. But I've learned even in good times and in bad times, in difficult times or easy times, I've learned just to be content. I've learned to be full and recognize that my fullness was not based on what you were going to give me or, what I, or, or even what I could do for myself. But contentment was, was something that was completely independent of all external circumstances, but entirely dependent upon who Jesus Christ is and who He is to me. This is a challenge. It's a challenge for our hearts when we consider the difficulties of our journey and all the pitfalls and all the difficulties that occur along that journey. Things that don't happen the way you hoped they would. And now suddenly you find yourself in, in a place of discontent. As a pastor, let me just share, this is something that's stretching me way outside my comfort zone, just doing these kinds of, of sessions of communicating virtually in a, in a virtual gathering, online on YouTube or Facebook. That is something completely foreign to me. My happy place, my comfort zone, is standing in front of a group of people, either on Wednesday night Bible study, as what I would be doing this evening, or standing in front of a group of people on Sunday who are excited to worship God, and we sing songs of praise together, and we, 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 we go through those, that liturgy, and that edifies us so much and brings so much a richness to our lives and we enjoy that and but now because of this virus that's taken over it seems in our culture this pandemic that ability has been taken from us oh, this is not a government plot this is not some deep dark sinister thing uh, from man's point but I will tell you it's a deep dark sinister thing from our the enemy of our soul standpoint it's His desire to use these circumstances to crush each of our hearts because we can't do things like we want. His desire is to keep us into a perpetual place or state of discontentment. Beloved, when you and I are discontent, it means we, we're not looking to Christ as being the complete source of who we are. And when we're not looking for, at Christ as being the complete source of who, who, of who we are, then we find ourselves diminished. We find ourselves empty. We find ourselves lacking or wanting. And so we find ourselves not content. Paul would say, this place of contentment where you don't lack any good thing, where you're satiated, you're full. That state of contentment, Paul would say, I accomplished it by learning. Now that's a powerful notion. Paul says, I learned to be content. Notice he didn't say, I prayed one day and suddenly the Holy Spirit just made me content. Notice he didn't say that I, I woke up one morning and and the world was just right and everything was content. It just happened, bam, suddenly. But Paul said, I learned to be content. There were so many things and challenges in, in Paul's life. The one where he shared where he had this thorn in the flesh. Whatever that thorn was, whatever that infirmity was, it was something that, that hindered Paul and he didn't like it. And and the Holy Spirit began to speak to him and say, I want you to understand something, Paul. My grace is sufficient for you. In other words, it's not, the important thing is not me taking this thorn out of your flesh. The important thing is for you to understand that my grace is always enough for you. I've done a lot of teaching on grace, and one of the things that I've shared is that, is that grace is so powerful. The grace of God is so expansive that there is nothing that can happen in your life that can outrun 
outpace, outmaneuver, outwit the grace of God. His grace is always enough. Whatever life loads on you on this side of the scale, if you will, God says, I've got enough grace to bring balance to it and even excel so that this thing that you identified as being so awful in your life is not the determining factor of your life. It doesn't rule you. It's, it's not the determining thing as to whether you have joy or peace. But Paul says, through trial and through difficulties, I've learned. I love the writer of Hebrews in chapter 5. It's one of our, if you're affiliated with our fellowship, the Plymouth Church, Church of God, you know this has become one of our refrigerator verses. And that's Hebrews 5, I believe it's verses 13 and 14. Where he says, Everyone that useth milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. But strong meat belongs to those that are of full age. Even those who by reason of use or practice have their senses trained to discern both good and evil. What is this writer trying to, what is the Holy Spirit trying to speak to us there? He's trying to marry with ex the exact words that Paul shared in Philippians 4.11 where he says, I've learned to be content. In other words, what Paul is saying is through practice. I'm no longer a baby. I'm no longer drinking milk. I'm no longer drinking, eating baby food. But I'm growing up. In other words, he says, I'm, 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 I'm a full age now. And I'm eating strong meat. And I did that by one means, by one method, and that is use, practice. I take the Word of God and I use it every day. I take the Word of God and I practice it every day. What does that mean? I rehearse it in my ears. When the enemy comes against my soul and tries to bring a spirit of discontent to me or a spirit of fear or anxiety to me, I simply pull out one of the scriptures that I've studied because I've practiced. I've learned. I simply pull one of those out. The Holy Spirit brings that to my mind. I pull it out and I apply it to my moment and I realize that that though the enemy would want to make me feel like I'm alone and isolated, I know I'm not because he says I'm with, he says he would be with me always. When the enemy of my soul would try to make me feel like I'm incapable, incapable of doing something, I retrieve the word of God that says that I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Not in my strength, but because I've learned. I've learned to be. How often do we put a mask on our face? I believe it's the, the, the motto of the state we live in, in North Carolina, to, to be rather than to seem to be. How often do we put masks on? We go to church and we we put those masks on and pretend that everything's okay. Or we go to work and we put our mask on and pretend everything is all right. But the reality is, is we're hurting. And I want us to understand something today. As we reflect on the Word of God, right where you are, right in the circumstances you're in, irrespective of the fact that the planets are not in perfect alignment, irrespective of the fact that things haven't happened the way you had hoped, or maybe because your, your life is constrained now and limited as to what you're able to do because of this pandemic, the Holy Spirit is wanting to share me to share with you today that, that there is a place in Jesus Christ that is safe, that is secure, a place that is content, satiated, so full of Christ, so full of His love, so full of His presence, that there's not room for anything else. Paul didn't come by that without trial. 
He didn't come to that place without day after day of personal discovery of how to apply the Word of God to his life. But he simply said, I've learned to be content. I've learned to walk into the truth of God's Word. And what it has taught me is that He is always enough. He was, he's always everything I need, and I don't need anything else. So let me lift you up today. You're God's chosen child. He loves you. He hasn't forgotten you. He knows you by name. And he wants to hold you close. And he wants you most of all to know that he is everything you need. You don't need him and anything else. Let's learn together to be content. Let's just simply learn together to be content. Let's practice it. Let's, let's walk it out together. Let me encourage you to leave a comment or a prayer request. Let's, let's let these Wednesday reflections be a time of conversation, if you will. And let's share thoughts with one another. That's how we grow. That's how we learn to be content. Is sharing with one another. Because you have experienced something that God has helped you with that, that I may not have entertained yet or faced yet. And I may need to know that. And vice versa. So let's have a conversation. Let's share with one another. My prayer continually is for you, for your peace, for your joy, for your rest. This is, as my good friend Anthony Braswell says, oh, I love how he words this in his church at North Park Church in Raleigh, is that this is not just a time for us to, to survive. Let's get out of survival mode. This is a period of time that God intends for us to thrive. I see so many encouraging things of growth taking place. People having conversations, people talking more, people oh, spending time with their families. I enjoyed so much having devotions with my wife this morning. It was rich. And there's so many mornings in the way things used to be that we were both so busy that we all went and did our separate things. And they were all good things. But let's thrive through this. And let's just trust God to do everything that needs to be done in, in each of our lives. We are stronger together. Let's go above and beyond to try to find ways to connect with not just our church family, but to other people. Let me encourage you to share this video in hopes that it will be an encouragement to someone else. May God bless you is my prayer. Father, as we reflect on your goodness today, I just simply ask Holy Spirit that you would just speak clearly to our hearts. Let us hear your voice above all the noise of what's going on around us. It's not, Father, that we're unsympathetic to the plight of people that are suffering, but God, help us against the backdrop of all the death and all the suffering and all the anxiety that's happening all around us. Let us find that place of peace that's in you. Let us find, Holy Spirit, that place where you minister to us, where you speak into our hearts. And so, Father, I, I speak peace right now into my brother and sister's hearts, into their lives, into their circumstances. I ask, Holy Spirit, that you would bless them and keep them, protect them under the shadow of your presence. And Lord, as we lay our heads down tonight for rest, let it be in a place, in a state of spiritual contentment through where we know without doubt that you are with us and that your hand is upon us all. And Father, we trust you for the coming days and for the decisions we'll have to make. We continue to pray your blessing and protection over everyone that is 
on the front lines in this pandemic, our medical workers, our public safety officials, our firemen, our EMS and rescue workers, our policemen, our Department of Social Services employees, everyone in these different sectors of our culture, Father, that are working so hard and putting themselves in harm's way, I pray your protection upon their head and upon their bodies and upon their families. Protect their hearts and their emotions. Many will be seeing things that are horrific, that are difficult. And God, I pray that your hand would be revealed in their lives and let them feel the spirit of contentment that only comes from knowing you. Teach us all in these times, Father, to learn as Paul to be content. And I'll give you thanks and praise for everything that you do. In Christ's name, amen. Amen. God bless you. I wish you could smell this Boston butt that I have smoking here. Uh, it has been almost hard at times for me to communicate with you today because of smelling this and enjoying the aroma of what's going on here. Uh, if it was not for this stay-at-home order, you'd be welcome at my house tonight to eat some of this with us. Uh, but instead, you enjoy your families. God bless you. I love you all. Amen.